resource if you have any questions in the area of philosophy, including philosophy of mind and history of philosophy. She specializes in the philosophy of René Descartes and the Cartesians of the 17th century. Okay, next, coming onto the stage is principal consultant and founder of Talent Scope Consulting, Steve Kim. Mr. Kim is a Drucker alum and is the founder of Talent Scope, where he helps small to mid-sized businesses perform better by hiring right. Trust me, a lot of organizations need this, like, you know, they need to start hiring right. Um, Talent Scope serves as the fractional CPO, Chief People Officer, for their clients by advising them ways to better attract, retain, and obtain the right fit for their companies. They also help coach managers and executives and provide them ways to make the most of their people's strengths, resulting in a more sustainable and thriving enterprises. Mr. Kim is also a current member of the CGU Alumni Board. Shout out to Michael Spicer, who's the president of Alumni Board, uh, which is working tirelessly connecting CGU alumni in ways to foster their professional and philanthropic development. And please join your hands to welcome Mr. Steve Kim. Thank you, thank you, Kanal. How's everyone doing? Woo! Woo! All right, awesome. It's great to. I'm going to take this off. I might be walking around the stage a little bit, but uh, it's a privilege to be with you. It's a wonderful and beautiful day. Did you feel that breeze a little bit? Yeah. That, that was really sweet. Um, <laughs> anyways, you know, this is probably one of the rare times where all of the various schools will be literally under one tent. And I thought maybe I'll just take a quick little breather. And I'd like all of the, uh, the folks from the various schools to stand up, and that way it'll give you a chance to kind of stretch out a little bit. And we're just going to kind of go down the line here, right? Uh, so if you are part of the School of Social Science Policy and Evaluation, which is basically the DBOSS folks, right? Uh, if you would please stand up so we can recognize you. I want to see all the, the faces to see how we represent them. Okay, great. Right. And I think that also includes Department of Politics, uh, Department of Politics and Education, or no, uh, ec Economics. There's a lot of acronyms, right? Uh, okay, next up, School of Community and Global Health. Can you have all the folks that are part of that school stand up? Okay. Okay, we already did that one. And uh, Institute of Mathematical Sciences. All right, so please stand up. All right, welcome. welcome. School of Arts and Humanities. And then, of course, my Honor, uh, the Drucker School. So all of you Drucker peeps, please stand up. All right, great. Thank you. And uh, we've got, oh, of course, the School of Educational Studies, all of our future faculty and teachers. Right. And Center for Information Systems and Technology. One more, right? Uh, Sotheby's Institute of the Arts, right? We don't want to, right? We want to make sure that they have to go. Okay, so I've got some notes, uh, but we, we can't go through all this. This is like 20 pages. Um, I will say though that uh, you know, along my journey, and I'm I'm really humbled to be able to share a glimpse into my CTU journey. You know, there's a lot of great people that I've met. Of course, I want to thank uh, the amazing faculty. I mean, we have some world-class professors, you know, and I know some of them may be here, they may not be, but uh, it's, it's just an opportunity for me to thank you know, professors like Bernie Jaworski, uh, VJ Safe, Jay Prague, Jenny DeRogue, uh, just to name a few. And um, these professors have made a profound influence on my life in terms of the, the learning and the teaching, and then also the fellow students that I've had a chance to learn from. 
And I think that's where you're gonna develop some of your greatest learning opportunities is just the interaction that you have with your fellow students. Um, and, and the classmates that you get to know on a more personal level. I know myself, one of my classmates actually became a good friend and together we developed this consulting partnership that eventually became TalentScope, right? It actually became a thriving consulting practice that actually made a living for myself and my family. Now, how's that sound? <laughs> you know, you learn a lot of these theories in class and figure out, well, how is this gonna translate into the real world? And actually, I remember um, going to class and thinking, wow, I could use this thing that we just learned for, for my clients the, the very next day. And, um, and actually, that was uh, one of the great benefits of, of some of my education at the Drucker School was giving me the confidence to actually go out and develop this consulting practice. So you never know where a conversation or a friendship may lead you. Um, I remember another time at the Hegel Burger Cafe. How many people are familiar with the Hegel Burger? You're gonna spend a lot of time there, by the way. Uh, and I remember having a conversation with uh, a, a classmate and he was just uh, finishing up his PhD. And he's saying, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this defense. And I never heard of the dissertation defense. And it, it kind of conjured up images of like an MMA, intellectual MMA. I don't know, he's gonna defend, someone's gonna attack him. Uh, I actually did attend his dissertation defense and it was actually pretty uneventful, uh, considering the colorful language of defense, right, that might uh, uh, cause you to think of some things. And I asked him, I said, so man, how, how did you do this PhD? I mean, this is, a, this is a long, arduous journey, right? I mean, I read somewhere it takes on average six years. And, and I was expecting kind of the usual suspect sort of answer. It's like, well, I have to work my butt off. There's a lot of sacrifice, time, toil, <clears throat> determination, um, and so on and so forth. A lot of support from family, spouse, whatnot. And the, in, the interesting answer that he gave was, well, Steve, um, at every single point, someone was counting on me for something. Whether it was a writing assistant, <clears throat> a, a professor, <clears throat> faculty advisor, someone was counting on me for something. And I thought, man, that's interesting because he had an accountability support structure, right? That if you look at professional athletes, if you look at people who succeed in any endeavor, right? And, and really business is, is often uh, referred to as a team sport. You don't do it on your own. You know, at every point he had some system of accountability, some support structure in place. And I remember one time uh, uh, asking my, my kid's mom when she was really into fitness and got into super good shape, I said, well, how, how did you do it? And she said, oh, that's easy. It was Anna, my workout partner, right? And so I, I thought, man, that's, that's interesting because uh, I wonder if there's a way to become more intentional about developing this system of having accountability partners, right? And um, to make a long story short, I actually ended up working with some fellow grad students to form what's known as an accountability platform, right? Mind Your Bliss, actually. And, and um, I actually developed a, a mindfulness practice through that accountability system. And, and actually, I did a professional development webinar, you can check it out on mindyourbliss.com, where I, I went through this uh, fitness transformation. I lost like 40 pounds in nine months using some of the habit change approaches that we developed and having the, the accountability system in place. So that was some really cool things um, that, that surfaced out of my time at CGU. Um, you know, just to give you a sense of how I got here, I, I uh, Back in 2005, you know, it was kind of a dark period of my life where I was suffering the, the fallout of a failed business, um, a private equity firm that went down the tubes, and then the tremendous stress that came out of that, the ensuing divorce, and still trying to be a good dad to my two boys at the time that were two and four. And uh, it, was, it, was a pretty, it was a pretty tough time trying to figure out what I'm gonna do. Um, and I remember uh, talking to my brother about uh, something, and he, he told me about a friend of his that, that graduated from this program called the Drucker School. It was an executive MBA, 
And I've never heard of an executive MBA program. I said, what the hell is an executive MBA? He goes, well, it's a program where, you know, especially folks that have been out of school for a while, um, they do this thing where you go to class at night. I said, man, that's interesting. You know, I've always been a fan of Peter Drucker. I've always been a fan of his philosophy and how he views business and, and management and how he views business and enterprises as kind of an organ of society that serves ultimately to do something beyond just growing for the sake of profits and, and making money alone. So I was always an admirer of Peter Drucker, and um, I, I started. Um, and at first, you know, there, there's, a great, there's a great quote, I don't know if some of you that um, have a regular practice of self-care, if you go to the gym, if you do yoga, if you run, there's this great quote that says, sometimes it's not about health or building muscle, it's just therapy. And, and sometimes going to class, you know, from seven to 10 at the time, after a long day of working, sometimes it was just therapy. <laughs> it wasn't about learning or getting an MBA, it was just, just getting away from the toils of life, right? The daily stresses. And uh, at the time, uh, Len, I don't know if they do this now, but they used to serve us dinner. A really nice dinner. I don't know. I don't know if I should say this or not. Some of you are like, "Wait a minute! <laughs> Things are supposed to be getting better. What happened to my dinner?" <laughs> but there's like they served me like steak and lobster. I kid you not. <laughs> and, and over time, that I think that practice sort of subsided because towards the end, I remember really good oatmeal cookies, uh, good, good oatmeal cookies and peanut butter cookies and coffee. Uh, but the point is, you know. You're there for three, four hours, um, and it's amazing. It's kind of like going to the gym. Sometimes I dreaded going. So, oh man, three hours, seven to ten. But then once you got there, you kind of settle in, and then you know you never know. You hear this spark of an idea, something that maybe one of your peers or classmates might say that caused you to think. I mean, a lot of times you're just sitting there, and, and sometimes you daydream, you're doodling, you're, you're writing in your notebook, you know, um, and some of that that learning, that, that those insights are what has shaped me today, all right? So I encourage all of you to make sure that you, you take that time to reach out and, and develop these friendships because you never know uh, where they might lead. You know, as a matter of fact, um, I think a lot of you who are starting your journey, right, MBA or PhD, whatever the case might be, um, and, and there's a lot of you out there, right? As a matter of fact, did you know, according to the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau report on educational attainment, that the number of PhDs has increased from two million to four and a half million over the last 18 years, and the number of master's degree holders has, has increased from 10 to over 20 million, 100% increase over that same period of 2000 to 2018. Whereas the population of, our, of the U.S. has only increased by 16%. So there's a lot more out, you, out there, and so uh, we're not the special snowflake that we thought we were. <laughs> I mean, how is it that there's more PhDs than, I mean, there's more PhDs than attorneys, which is a good thing, I think. <laughs> Definitely a good thing. So it's, it's not enough just to get this, this PhD, right? Uh, it has to mean something. And... Um, and that brings me to my next story, uh, which involves a 20-mile hike in a single day, uh, in a trail through the wilderness. And it was because uh, my son, uh, his Boy Scout troop, had this thing called a hiking merit badge. It was probably the most difficult uh, merit badge, uh, most taxing physically. And so, uh, like a good dad, I said, okay, I'm gonna sign up for this thing. You know, there's, there's three, three dads and a mom, including myself, and then um, 12 scouts. So I remember it was a whole day affair from 7 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. And I remember uh, we're at the, the trailhead, and I, and I turned to the adults, and I'm thinking, man, you know, 20 miles. We're really gonna do this on purpose? <laughs> I mean, it was, it was insane. You know, at, at the end of it, for the next two, three days, I was like walking like a man without a cane. You know, it was just, it was brutal. It was brutal. You know, and, and so, um, why do I bring up this story? Well, 
Carlos Castaneda, um, an anthropologist uh, back in the 60s, had, had this saying about follow, follow a path with heart, right? That the only worthwhile path is the one that has heart. And the only worthwhile challenge is to traverse its length, right? And you think about that 20 mile hike, and if someone said, Steve, were you following a path with heart? I'd say, hell no, I wasn't following a path with heart. <laughs> this was brutal, it was, it was, it was tough. But when you look at it from a more transcendental perspective, right, and if I kind of zoom out and, and, and see what that was all about, you know, it really was me following a path with heart. What, what is the path with heart? It's the things that you hold dear and near to your heart. It's the things that you value, right? And I value time with my son, spending time with my youngest son. You know, we can commiserate later about, man, remember that 20 mile hike that we did? on purpose there was no there was no we weren't at war right there's no natural disaster no cataclysmic right it wasn't like we had to travel 20 miles to the nearest water food or shelter we just we just did it because it was one of the requirements for hiking mirror you know but it was a great experience to be able to bond with my son and and i think that's to me when you when you when you talk about a path with heart Right? It's about the things that you hold close to your heart, right? the things that you value. You know, Joseph Campbell, how many of you have heard of Joseph Campbell, right? I'm sure some of you. Check him out. He's an amazing uh, anthropologist, and he's also known for the power of myth and a hero with a thousand faces. He talks about this idea of, of following your bliss, right? Following your bliss. If you do follow your bliss, all right? There's going to be a track that's been there all the while waiting for you. All right? Do not be afraid. There will be doors that will open where you didn't think there would be. All right? And then you'll start living the life right, that you ought to be living. And um, what is this idea of following your bliss? All right? now, now, some people at the time in the, in the 70s, they took it as just following your, your pleasure or, or, or some type of hedonistic lifestyle. And, and actually, that wasn't really what he was talking about. And uh, towards the end of his life, he was saying, man, I should have said, follow your blisters. <laughs> you know, because uh, really what that means is what, what is the struggle? What is the, what is the, uh, the, the enduring that is worthy, right? And actually, if you replace the word bliss with, with, uh, with passion, right, or actually it comes from the word passio, the Latin. Have you, how many have you have seen that movie, The Passion of the Christ? I, I don't know, I haven't seen it, but I was always <laughs> really curious about why in the world do they call it Passion of the Christ? I was clueless, I was like, that seems like a very odd, because usually you associate passion with, with liking, enthusiasm, I mean, that didn't look like any enthusiasm to me. <laughs> but it really comes from the word passio, which means suffering, enduring. So, if you look at it from that perspective, what is worthy of your struggling? What is worthy of your enduring? And I know some of you, you know, you have that, that, that passion. I hope all of you have a passion. If you haven't really found it, find out what that is for you, right? Um, and um, as I kind of close my remarks today, I mean, I, I want to talk about one, one last thing. And there's this great song that I heard recently about a month ago. And check it out on YouTube. It's it's uh, by Sissel. This is a world-renowned soprano, and she sings this great song called "Slowing Down." And if you find it, it's like uh, Pioneer Day. If you look it up on YouTube, it's it's minute forty-eight because I was I was telling my brother about it, he couldn't find it. But it's in, it's in the middle of the performance, and it kind of served as a, a little bit of inspiration for 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 the last thing I want to talk about. And um, you know, there's this uh, story. African safari, American goes, and it always has to be in Africa, right? It's some exotic locale. So anyways, to make a long story short, he's, he's on the safari where every day he's, he's, he's going far, he's, he's traveling fast, right? And he's got some helpers, you know, helping him carry stuff. And, and on the first morning, he's, he's got lots of things he's got to get done. He wants to see a lot of things. The second morning, same thing. He's getting up early. He's trekking it out there. Um, traveling far and fast, and by the third morning, same thing, All right? A lot of you can probably relate. You're getting up, you're, you're doing things, you're probably busier than you, you, you should be or want to be. 
And so by the fourth morning, um, his helpers are, are sitting under a, a, a tree in the shade and they're not moving well into the morning. And so he's, he's like, well, what, what's the deal here? I mean, he's getting pretty irate. We got places to go, people to see. I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. What, what are they doing? And so the translator is telling him, well, <clears throat> they're, uh, they're waiting for their spirits to catch up to them. And apparently they had left their souls behind two days ago, so they're just waiting for their spirits to catch up. Right. And um, I know that I'm, I'm guilty of, of leaving my spirit behind. You know, I remember one time <clears throat> I was uh, at my kid's mom's house, and um, fortunately we, we have a great relationship, and, and um, I, I plopped on the living room couch, and, <clears throat> and she's asking me, so how are you doing? And instead of the perfunctory, like, oh, I'm fine, everything's good, you know, that's what you say, right? I, I sat there thinking, how am I really doing? And, you know, for the life of me, I could not answer. I did not have the words to really tell her how I'm doing. You know, I mean, sometimes you have to, uh, Jeremy Hunter has this great, great saying, you had to check your dip stick, right? I just couldn't tell her. I said, I don't know, uh, I, I guess grateful, you know, sheepishly. I, I really didn't know what to say to her. You know, and then I, I thought, you know, several weeks later, I said, you know, probably the reason why I couldn't tell her is because I left my spirit behind. The part of me that could accurate, that could really authentically answer that question, I left behind because I'm too busy. I'm too busy with my life, right? Doing what I'm doing. I'm a human doing, not a human being. And, and I know that... I know probably a lot of you in this room, uh, you know, can, can relate to that. So my parting words is to slow down, you know, be still and listen. You know, Peter Drucker says that um, follow effective action with quiet reflection. And from that quiet reflection will come even more effective action. And he didn't say noisy reflection, quiet and so how do we become quiet? We have to reach that state of stillness. How do we become still? We gotta slow down. And I don't know what that slowing down might look for you, but I encourage you, whatever form that takes, I mean, take some time to enjoy the beauty of, of, of Claremont. Have you been to the, to the Marzen Quad, the oak trees out there? It's, it's magnificent. You know, take a time to sit under the oak, the oak trees. Uh, take a performance at the Bridges Hall of Music. Right? Enjoy the beauty that Claremont can afford while you're here and take that time to slow down, you know, listen, and be still. Thank you so much. How's everyone feeling? That was a really good speech. I can't do that. But, um, <laughs> but he is a director alum, so you know, I'm proud of him. Um, <laughs> next, I want to thank our sponsors for making today happen. We have three levels. Uh, flame level, spark level, and flicker 